Okay, welcome back everyone. Let's get started. So, welcome to lecture 10. The topic for today will be neural networks and backpropagation under the umbrella of, of deep learning. Uh, so, uh, before we jump into today's topics, a uh, quick recap of what we covered um, in lecture 9 last Friday. So, lecture 9 was all about Bayesian methods and we saw two different kinds of Bayesian methods, parametric and non-parametric with an example each. In parametric, we saw Bayesian linear regression and the general approach in um, with, with, Bayes, with, with Bayesian methods for supervised machine learning in a parameterized setting is to have a parameter theta and we assume it is distributed according to a prior distribution, some p of theta, right? And this is the assumption that distinguishes Bayesian methods from frequentist methods that we assign a prior probability to the unknown parameters. And then um, again in the supervised setting, we assume y comes from some distribution p of y given uh, theta comma x, which is also called the likelihood. And from this, from the observed data where uh, x and y are your uh, training set, we construct the posterior distribution where theta hat, which is now a random variable is is um, is derived as p of theta given x comma y using the Bayes rule, and that's you know that's how the name Bayesian methods uh, comes into picture because the way we construct um, the posterior is using the Bayes rule. There is no gradient descent, there is no maximum likelihood. We just condition on the observed data, and we get our posterior distribution. And then using the uh, posterior distribution, we can then construct the posterior predictive distribution. Which, um, which is used for making predictions on new unseen data examples. Right? So, y star condition on x star comma x comma y, what this means is x comma y is your training set that you observed in the past and x star is the new input that you encounter and we need to pr make a prediction about y star. And what we do is construct a distribution over y star given the new input and all the past training inputs. And that is called the posterior predictive distribution and this is what the uh, posterior predictive distribution is defined to be. And we saw that um, there was also a Piazza post where the steps for this was described in detail. Uh, we saw that this distribution can be expressed as an expectation of P of Y star given X star and uh, um, theta hat where theta hat is comes from the posterior distribution. The interpretation of this is that for every possible setting of the theta vector, we get a different model, a predictive model. And the posterior predictive distribution takes the average across all possible models that can possibly exist, you know, that's infinitely many. But the average is a weighted average where the weights are decided according to the posterior distribution, right? And um, so, so this, this um, kind of averaging across models uh, where we don't commit ourselves to only uh, any one given single model, but we are still kind of hedging our bets against all possible models, but we just weight them differently according to the posterior distribution. And this is, um, um, as you know, there, there, there's, uh, you might read this in several other places as well. This makes Bayesian methods kind of prone to overfitting, right? This, this makes it fundamentally prone to overfitting. Uh, there is no, there is no other extra steps you need to take in order to make your models not overfit. And we'll go into the, into um, more details about this probably in Wednesday or Friday's lecture. Uh, but this, this kind of model averaging where we don't commit ourselves to one single model, uh, which may, which could, uh, which could be due to noise in your data, right? We, we don't commit ourselves to one single model, but instead we consider all the possible models, the infinitely many possible models that you get for different values of theta. And we take a weighted average across the predictions where the weights are decided by the posterior distribution, right? So this is in the parametric setting where a theta exists, right? So this, this, this whole setting, this whole exercise is in, revolves around theta and, and that's why we call it uh, uh, parametric uh, Bayesian methods. In the non-parametric approach, uh, we assume y equals some function f, f of x plus uh, some noise where noise uh, epsilon comes from a normal um, uh, di distribution and we assume that there is a prior distribution on f, 
just the way there was a prior distribution on theta, here we assume there is a prior distribution on, on f and that prior distribution is a Gaussian process. So this is called a, a Gaussian process prior and in order to define a Gaussian process prior, its parameter so to speak is a mean and a covariance function. So this is actually a mean function uh, which I have just written as 0, it means it evaluates to 0 everywhere. And the way to think of a Gaussian process is with the same analogy as uh, we went from vector to functions as an infinite dimension, uh, infinite uh, extension of a vector. Similarly, a Gaussian process is an infinite extension of a multivariate uh, Gaussian distribution, right. And for vectors, um, to functions the relation was indices of vectors become the domain of the function. Similarly, indices of your multivariate Gaussian become the domain of um, the functions over which we are, we are um, um, defining the GP. Okay. And we saw a few properties about, multi, uh, about multivariate Gaussians. So we saw the normalization property that if we integrate out all the data, it ha the density of the multivariate Gaussian must evaluate to 1. We saw the marginalization property where um, suppose in this example, if you want to marginalize out B from this multivariate distribution, then all we get is A and mu A and sigma A square. So all the rows and columns that correspond to the, the variable that we are marginalizing out, just wipe them out of your multivariate Gaussian, it is that simple. Okay? Uh, that is that's a special property about Gaussians which uh, do not don't exist for other distributions in general. And that's, that makes uh, Gaussian, process, Gaussian distributions uh, really nice. And then we saw the conditioning uh, rule where the multivariate version appears complex at first, but if we see the analogy in case of two-dimensional Gaussians, um, the conditioning looks like this. A given B is again a normal distribution. If A and B are jointly distributed, then A given B is again a normal distribution whose mean is given by this. The interpretation here is we, when, when the value of B is given, first we standardize it, that is divided by its mean and divided by its standard deviation. So it is like a Z value. Transform the Z value by the correlation coefficient and then do the reverse transform like the, the, the inverse Z um, uh, uh, transform back into mu A uh, by, by scaling it by A's standard deviation and adding A's mean. Right? That is how we, we, uh, we update the A, uh, A's uh, mean. And then the covariance of A or the variance of A given B is the variance of E scaled by 1 minus rho square where rho is the correlation coefficient. So what this means is if if rho is 1, if A and B are perfectly correlated, then by observing B, the variance of A reduces to 0, right? 1 minus 1 is 0, which means you know exactly what A is. And similarly, if the covariance between A and B is 0, if there is no co covariance whatsoever, then the variance of A given B will still be mu of A square. So there was no reduction in uncertainty by observing B if there was no correlation between them. Right? Um, so these, these properties. Using these properties, we constructed a Gaussian process regression. So the um, analogous to this, we define f and f star where these are the function f evaluated at our training set and function f evaluated at our test sets. And this follows a multivariate Gaussian distribution because that is the property of Gaussian processes where you take any finite subsample of your Gaussian process, that will be a Gaussian distribution multivariate Gaussian distribution and this is the kernel function evaluated at every possible uh, pairs. Right? And so this is the, this is, we get this by marginalizing out the GP, uh, from the GP all the variable, all the test exam, test and train examples that we have not observed. So marginalize out everything that you have not seen and this condenses your Gaussian process into a multivariate Gaussian evaluated only at, at uh, the test and uh, train points. And the assumption was y equals f plus epsilon right? and uh, using the addition property of uh, Gaussians which I forgot to recap, using the addition property of Gaussians, uh, y equals f plus epsilon, so f plus epsilon gives us this, epsilon uh, it, you still have the same mu but because uh, f and epsilon are independent, the covariances add up and epsilon is, um, is a diagonal matrix so you only add along the diagonal and you get uh, a distribution for y is given excess. And using this, using the uh, conditioning property, we construct the posterior predictive distribution 
which which evaluates to some form. It might look uh, complex, but uh, this whole expression for the so the variance is exactly this, but a multivariate version of this. Right? It, it it just looks more complex, but it's essentially the same. And um, similarly, the mean is is is, is uh, very similar to that. And and this is all Gaussian process is about. It's very simple. You perform one conditioning, and and that's it. So, any questions about GPs before we move on to uh, deep learning today? Yes. They will not be prone to overfitting. Okay. Yeah. So, because that's Bayesian method, right? Or so, in general, Bayesian methods are are um, you know you consider them as not prone to overfitting uh, because um, the 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 intuition there is that overfitting happens due to the fact that you're committing yourself to just one model given your training data, which which may be swayed by swayed due to noise right and and here we are kind of hedging our bets by not committing to any single model we are considering all the possible models that could possibly exist and we are taking the average across them where the average is weighted by the uh, weight uh, by the posterior distribution so variability is swayed by since it's not done exactly each data and then that's what overfitting is happening right well look, um, let, we'll go into details to that on on wednesday and friday and and um, i would postpone that you know, answer to that uh, uh, for a couple more days. But in general, the intuition is that with Bayesian methods, the at, at least at a theoretical level, the concept of overfitting does not exist. All right. So today, the topic for today is neural networks and 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 deep learning. Right. And again, in order to uh, motivate deep learning and neural networks, right. Um, the the uh, so the models that we've seen so far, for example, um, we saw we saw linear regression, we saw logistic regression, GLMs, etc. They've all been linear, and one way we kind of introduced nonlinearity was using kernels, right? And also using feature maps, and we saw that kernels and feature maps are kind of very tightly related to each other, right? For every feature map. Is a feature map is associated with some kernel, right? And that was one way to introduce uh, nonlinearity. And neural networks is another way, right? In neural networks, the the high level picture to have in your mind is that when we defined a feature map, for example, in in problem set one, uh, the last question, we we uh, explored different kinds of feature maps on a simple regression task that gave us you know very flexible um, hypotheses and the feature map we used there was you know for example we used a polynomial feature map p of x equals 1 x x square x cube and maybe things like sine x you know you can add you can add uh, more features right and the responsibility of coming up with such a feature map was in the hands of the designer, the one who was training the model, the one, you know, the data scientist who was trying to fit this model on on uh, on the data had to, you know, use their intuition, use their creativity to come up with a suitable feature map, right? And that is is uh, hard work, right? You need to have some kind of an intuition. You need to, you know, think hard to see uh, to 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 make some decisions about what features to include, what features not to include, and at a high level. What neural networks uh, does for you is is give you a way in which features themselves are learned automatically, right? So the models that we've seen so far, given features, we constructed linear models for you know a regression, classification, etc. With neural net networks, not only are we learning that model given the features, but we are also learning what the right set of features are, right? And the, the, um, it's probably best, best explained by looking at an example of, of what I mean by that. So supposing we have some input x, you know, in Rd, and let's say we represent x as a set of nodes where we have 
d number of nodes. So, this corresponds to x 1, this corresponds to x d, right. And the way we constructed logistic regression, for example, you know, just to consider an example, was we had uh, a parameter vector and that parameter vector So, here uh, just like uh, SVMs, we are going to switch our notation and use W and B for weights and biases. Uh, we had W1, W2, W3, W2, WD and we had bias and over here. this was summation i equals 1 to d x i w i plus b, right. So, this is uh, you can think of this as theta transpose x where uh, theta was the collection of w and b and um, x is the x vector along with the intercept term 1, right. And let us call this z that is z equals x transpose w plus b and on the other side let us call this a equals g of z where g is some kind of uh, a nonlinearity right. For example, in, in the case of logistic regression g was 1 over 1 plus e to the minus z or g of z was 1 over 1 plus e to the minus z, right. So, this was uh, this was logistic regression just visualized in a different way as nodes and connections, right. And this is the view or this is the interpretation that we are going to use for extending this further uh, and construct neural networks out of them, right. So, we used to have a parameter vector theta, instead of that we visualize parameters as connections between some node to another node, right. And in neural neural network terminology, these nodes are called neurons, right. So, um, to clarify, um, the reason why they are called neurons is because uh, early in the development of neural networks, the design of, of, of uh, this, this kind of a design was inspired by how neurons possibly work based on the theory of how neurons work back then. But um, it is, it's, you know, you see a lot of literature where people say neural networks mimic neurons and that is just not the case, right. Neural networks when they were designed were inspired by how people thought neurons work back then, right. And uh, in no way whatsoever do neural networks mimic neurons or mimic the brain, right. So, you know, just have that in the back of your mind and, and neurons is probably um, therefore a, a poor choice of word. You can call it nodes and that is just fine, but you know we call it neurons uh, assuming you guys know that you know this is not how actual neurons work, right. So, there is some nonlinearity um, which takes, for, takes us from z to an output a, we are going to call a as the output of the nonlinearity, right. And together this this entire assembly we will call it a neuron and in this particular um, uh, configuration x1 to xd is fixed right there there is no feature map here x1 through xd is fixed and um, everything that, that we have seen over here is basically exactly logistic regression with no difference whatsoever, right. And we could for example, if this was logistic regression, then we would call this um, our y hat as A, right. And we would have the right label y and we would construct a loss y comma y hat is equal to y log y hat plus 1 minus y 
log 1 minus y hat. And in place of y hat, we would express y hat as a function of w's and b's and perform gradient descent. Right? That, that was logistic regression. Any questions on this of, of why this is similar to logistic regression? Is a question? Yeah, so uh, this, this is a logistic regression viewed in terms of connections and, and neurons, so to speak. Okay. Now, the, what we're going to do next is basically take this network, you now come back to this network view and start growing this network. So, x1 through xd. This is our input layer again. Okay. And in place of one neuron, let's have a collection of neurons. So here we had a set of weights connecting. We had a set of weights that connected the input to as a uh, uh, from X as the, the uh, input data to the input of this neuron. And just like that, let's add a second neuron here and give it its own set of weights. Right? And this is as if we are, we are trying to train two different logistic regression models in parallel. You know, that's the image, to, you know, that's the picture to have. We have one set of, one set of, uh, W's that connect X's to this neuron and another set of W's that connect the X's to the second neuron. They have their own bias term as well. And similar, similarly, there's going to be a Z here goes through the uh, uh, nonlinearity to get an A. Similarly, the, the, uh, the Z's are basically the linear combinations of X's with W's plus B. The same thing over here. And let's call this B1 and B2, B2. And this is Z1, Z2, and A1 and A2. So from Z to A, we apply the G function, the nonlinearity to take the linear combination. We get a scalar, run it through the nonlinearity, we get another scalar. And we can, we can continue this. So similarly, we can have a Z3 and an A3. Again, that has its own sets of weights and its own bias, B3. So you get Z3 as the sum over W1, X1, W2, X2, WD, XD plus B3. And then apply the nonlinearity and you get A3. And not only can we add multiple models like this, we can then start nesting them. In the sense, these three, the outputs of these three, that is uh, A1, A2, A3, can now become the input for another logistic regression. It's going to be a Z and an A. Similarly, second logistic regression using the inputs as the outputs from the first layer. Z and A. Right? And so on. We can nest this even further. Yes, question? We'll come to that. We'll come to that. Uh, so, so the question was, uh, won't they all learn the same same uh, same model? Aren't they going to be just copies of the same model? Um, in potentially, it can, and we'll we'll address that shortly. Was there another question? Yeah, my question is how the second layer will learn something different. I guess. Yeah, we'll come to that. We'll come to that. For now, we're just constructing a network. Uh, 
using base components that we've seen before, basically logistic regression, right? So take logistic regression, create multiple copies of it, take the outputs of those logistic regressions, feed them as input to you know, a nested logistic regression and so on. And this kind of a network can be arbitrarily deep and arbitrarily wide. Right? And it can be arbitrarily wide to different levels at different layers. And we're going to call, start giving them names. So this collection of neurons, we're going to call it the input layer. Right? And This over here is the output layer, and these are called hidden layers. So this would be hidden layer 1, hidden layer 2, right? And this overall network, you can call it maybe a three-layer network, right? So you have an output layer, hidden layer, uh, hidden layer one, hidden layer two. So you have um, um, three layers, and generally we don't count the input layer. You know, input is just input, right? And soon we are going to give more more precise terminologies to each each of these uh, weights and and uh, weights and biases and activations. But before that, uh, it's important to get this general intuition of of how neural networks are kind of constructed. Um, this is an example of a very simple neural network. Um, there are lots of different choices for the G function. You don't always have to use the logistic, uh, logistic function. But the general idea is more or less the same. That is, we take um, a linear model with some activation. Um, in GLMs, we saw that um, for different kinds of outputs, we use different kinds of Gs. Similarly, uh, here we can use, uh, there is a wide variety of choices of the uh, activation functions that we can use. So G is also called the activation function. Right? And using this, this linear model building block, we start assembling a big network as though these are, you know, think of them as Lego blocks, right? You place one block here, one block here, one block here, and then started building yet another layer on top and so on, right? And, and, and now, once we construct a layer, uh, a network with, you know, some number of layers, each layer being, you know, some having some particular width, and finally at the output layer, the output, the A of the last layer will be considered our Y hat. And then we are going to get the true label y, and we are going to apply construct some kind of a loss. Right? Previously, we would take the output of the very first layer, y hat, and apply our loss. But now, we are going to nest these building blocks into a more complex network, and we are going to construct the network that eventually we are going to have a single output, and that output will be the, the prediction made by this network on which we're going to apply a loss. And this is the big picture to have in mind. Deep learning is basically adding depth by cascading simple building blocks using non-linearities in the middle. Any question about the big picture we, before we start defining uh, terminology and, and giving uh, specific uh, uh, numbers here? Yes, question? Yes. So the first layer of this approach was using that uh, middle of layer. Yeah. In second layer, you can use a different function. Yes. So the question is, uh, do the uh, the activation function, the choice that we used in the first layer, should it be the same, uh, say, for the second layer, right? And in in theory, they they can be different. You can use different activation functions for different neurons. Even then, it need not even be the same within uh, the same layer. But in practice. Uh, we generally tend to use the same activation function throughout the network, but you know that's that's uh, that's a convention. That's not a requirement. Good question. Right. So now um, let's start. Uh, yes, question. Uh, 
yeah we're going to come to that so so the question was if we have a loss function here what are we going to update the uh, answer is once we apply a loss function we need to calculate gradients with respect to every single connection and bias right the the um, the goal of 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 our training is to first uh, come up with a network architecture and once you come up with a network architecture uh, you take your data start feeding your input you get some predicted output calculate the loss and then calculate the the gradient of that loss with respect to every connection right, in parallel and take a gradient descent step to to minimize that loss in along the direction of that gradient so i guess it's easy to do stochastic yeah 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 we'll we'll we'll, we'll come to that of uh, you know where generally uh, stochastic gradient descent is the one that's most commonly used uh, and uh, in fact a variant of that called mini batch stochastic gradient we'll we'll come to that right so let's let's uh, start giving some precise terminology so that we are clear of what we are we are uh, uh, referring to so we will use um, all the all the connections we will use the letter w so w will mean connection and b will be bias right and z will be w dot something plus b so z will always be linear in w and linear in b and linear with whatever we multiply b uh, w by a will always be g of some z and as as um to distinguish the different z's and the different a's and the different b's and w's we're going to use the notation where a superscript identifies the layer okay. a superscript is going to identify the layer and a subscript is going to identify which node in that layer we are referring to right so we're going to have a i j i i i so the a's there are only so a's and z's and b's is a vector per layer whereas the weights the connections um are a matrix so these are vectors so this is the vector a this is the vector z and this is the vector b and you have one such vector per layer one vector of a one vector of z and one vector of b per layer but we have one matrix w per layer so w is going to be uh, uh, it's also called the weight matrix and that's why it has two indices i and j and the the very first input x will also be called a0 so it's like the output of the zeroth layer so you kind of bootstrapping this this hierarchy by considering the inputs to be the output of the zeroth layer you know we, but we're just going to consider the x's as, as just given so think of x's as the um, output of the activation from the zeroth layer and z 1 so z 1 we are referring to this vector z superscript uh, square bracket 1 refers to this z vector and in that let's uh, consider z 1 1 so z 1 1 is uh, in the in the in the in the z vector of the first layer the first uh, element of that vector will be some over w uh, j um some over j w 1 j x or 
So W is now a matrix that has, so a matrix has, has uh, two axes, two dimensions. The number of rows in the matrix is the number of neurons in that layer and the number of columns in that matrix is the number of neurons in the input layer, in the previous layer. So W is a matrix, W L is the weight matrix, where the number of rows is the, num is the, um, is the number of neurons in the layer, okay, so this is number of neurons in the Lth layer and the number of columns is the number of neurons in the L minus 1th layer. Right. So that's, uh, that's a W matrix. And Z11 is therefore the first row of the weight matrix dot producted with the A0 vector, that is dot producted with the input, right? And that, that's basically uh, doing this for you, you know, W1x1, W2x2, W3x3, and so on, plus B1. And similarly, Z2 of 1 is equal to W2 of 1. This time I'm going to write it as a transpose so that just to uh, simplify 0 plus B2. This is just the uh, uh, the dot product and, and in, in this version I have written as a dot product right? and so on. And so that gives that gives us the collection of Zs and similarly then A of 1, 1 equals G of Z, 1, 1. The activation functions are applied element wise. For a given value of z that was calculated with the uh, dot product and adding of the sum, the a function is applied element-wise separate. Uh, the g function is applied element-wise separately to each of the z values to get the corresponding a values. And so on, and, and 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 similarly, once we have constructed the a one vector, so a superscript one is the output of the first layer. So uh, in this case, the vector that comes out of the first layer will be a superscript one, right? And the dimension of this vector is equal to the number of neurons in the first layer. Is that clear? And we can we can continue this this uh, style of nesting even further. So we will we will then have z two. Question. Yes, question. So you are saying that uh, z two is written in uh, matrix form. So w so so w is a matrix. Right. Sorry, yeah. I meant representation. Mm -hmm. Good question. Let's let's. Uh, is is this a the one you're referring to? Yeah. Yeah. So a 
A11 means the output of the first layer and the first element of that vector is equal to the activation function applied on the first element of the, z of, uh, the z vector of the first layer. Yeah, so so z. So let me let me um, write this in vector notation. So here we were calculating it element wise. So this is z11. One one, this is z superscript one subscript two. This is z superscript one subscript three, okay. right? And if you want to write it in vector form, then you would write this as z of superscript one is equal to w of superscript 1 times A of, super, of superscript 0 plus B superscript 1, right? Now we are writing this in vector notation where Z superscript 1 is this entire Z vector, okay. right? And that is equal to the W matrix times the input vector plus element wise addition due to the uh, summing up of the b vector, the bias vector. So z is just a linear combination of w's and a's plus the b's. Uh, I would say do not think of a as the probability. If you take it through a sigmoid, you get a value between 0 and 1. Um, for now, do not treat it as a probability. Just think of it as, you know, some output of some nonlinearity, right? So the a is if, if, if G is the sigmoid, then A will be between 0 and 1, yes. Good question. Any, 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 other, any other questions? Right. So this is a compact way of writing these element-wise operations. Right. So the full, the full Z vector, that is uh, the vector Zs before applying the nonlinearity, this vector of size 3 is equal to a matrix W, in this case, the matrix W will be 3 cross D, where D is the um, uh, uh, dimension of the input. So the, the input dimension goes to the number of columns and 3 is the number of outputs, that is the number of, um, number of neurons in this layer. So that would be 3 here, D here. So W1 will be 3 cross D. A0, that is the uh, A0 is the X vector. A0 is d dimensional, so this would be according to this network, this is 3 cross d and this is d dimension and this is 3 dimension and z will also be therefore 3 dimension. Is this clear? And, and, and then we apply the, the nonlinearity on this z, that is on the left half of these circles, we apply the nonlinearity to jump over to the right half of the uh, circle to get a's. And the g function is applied separately element wise. Yes, question? So in this case, 3 is the number of neurons. The number of input nodes is d-dimensional. Okay. So then the number of neurons would also be d, right? So the number of neurons, here we have chosen this to be 3, okay. right? And the W matrix takes you from d to 3, right? So the W matrix takes you from d to 3. When you up multiply it with x, which is 3, uh, uh, which, which is d-dimensional, you multiply the W matrix with X and because the number of rows in W is 3, you get a vector of dimension 3 and to that you add a B vector which is also of dimension 3. So you get a Z vector of dimension 3. Any other questions? Good. So um, the thing to kind of keep in mind is uh, whenever we, we, we see some kind of a subscript, uh, at, at least uh, in case of uh, logistic regression, when, when we thought, when we saw an xj, we thought of this as a scalar where x was in 
R D, right? Uh, however, when we see a superscript, right, we are still referring to, you know, the vector or scalar or whatever it is, but it's only identifying which layer we are at, right? So z of one is not the first element of z, it just means it's the z vector of the first layer, right? So the superscript square bracket refers to the layer number. If something is not clear, please stop me. It's it's uh, super important that you know you understand this really well because you know once we go to back propagation, uh, we're just going to use all these um, um, all these notations very liberally there. So you know, if there's any question, feel free to stop me as many number of times you want. So uh, so now a one. Loosely speaking, we can call it g of z1 where you can think of g as uh, the nonlinearity for example the sigmoid being applied element wise separately to each uh, uh, element in the input vector right and then similarly z2 is now w2 times a1 plus b2 And this gives us a3, uh, sorry, a2 equals g of z2. And so on, right? And then z3 equals w3 of a2 plus B3 and A3 equals G of Z3. And you can and you can take this as arbitrarily deep as you want. Right? And this this depth is what is what is the basically the reason why we call this deep learning you know uh, the deeper your network is you know the more deeper your deep learning is you know so to speak right uh, so the the number of level uh, the number of degrees of nesting you have is called the depth of your network right and and this is what distinguishes from you know uh, simple linear models where then there was pretty much no depth at all right there was just one single layer and the output of the layer was the output of, of, uh, of your hypothesis, right? And we can go on. And uh, and now the question is, why do we have this g to be a nonlinear function, right? What if g was identity, that is? What if g of z was just z? That is, if a equals z, what would happen in that case? Yes, question. Exactly. So the reason why um, you know um, uh, the, the reason why it's important to have nonlinearities is because if z was just uh, uh, if, if g was just the identity function, then a3 would have been, just to simplify the argument, uh, we're going to ignore the b terms, uh, but you can include the b terms here and, and the same argument will still hold. Let's, let's uh, assume that the b's are just zeros for now. So a3 will be g of z3, right? And g of z3 is just z3. But Z3 is W3A2, so this is W3A2, right? But A2 is G of Z3 and G is identity, so this is W3 of Z2, right? But Z2 is W2 of A1, so W3 
that is 2 of a1 and similarly a1 is g of z1 if z is identity then you know this becomes z1 z1 and this again w3 times w2 times w1 times x right and this is basically a matrix times a matrix times a matrix and we can call this some w tilde times x. So, if g were not a nonlinear function, but assume it to be just some you know a linear function, then this entire network can now be represented as a single matrix, right, which means we have not really gone beyond the scope of linear models. So, any such networks can be represented by a linear model if g is not a nonlinear function, right? And so, G being nonlinear is essential to have depth be meaningful. Otherwise, all the all, no matter how many levels deep your network is, it can always be collapsed into a, a single matrix, and it will effectively be as expressive as a single layer network. This question. Yeah, so the question is what is what if what if uh, um, even though we have you know so many matrices why is it you know still effectively the same as one 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 way to think about that is you can think of these the the w matrices in your networks which have arbitrary you know widths as being uh, a decomposition of your w tilde matrix right so you you take a w tilde matrix and decompose it into product of you know other matrices and those will be your weight matrices Yes, question. So we're going to come to that. So uh, um, you mean why G is the sigmoid? Yes. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So. So Z. So G of Z clearly should not be just Z, because then you know there is no depth in the network. Then the question is, what can Z be? What can G be rather? So, g of z can be any function which is uh, nonlinear, but in deep learning we choose you know some kind of a nonlinear function that is also monotonic, right. So, g of z equals 1 over 1 plus e to the minus z. So, that is the familiar sigmoid function, you know that works. g can sometimes be tan h. So, tan h is basically e to the z plus or is it minus yeah e to the g to the e to the z minus e to the minus z over e to the z plus e to the z this is the hyperbolic tangent right and this also looks very similar to uh, the sigmoid except instead from you know uh, 0 to 1 it is minus 1 to plus 1 you know just a different choice and a very common one of g is relu it's also called the rectified linear unit and this is basically max of z comma 0 what does this look like it basically looks like this So, this is z, this is ReLU of z, right? And similarly, here you know, uh, this was z and this is tan h of z, and here this was z and this is sigmoid of z, this is z and this is the ReLU of z, right? Uh, what ReLU does is um, if z is negative, it just sets it to 0. If it is positive, it leaves it as it is. 
right? and this is a nonlinearity, right? And if if g's are the ReLU function, then you cannot represent w as you know product of uh, other w's. And and these are you know probably the you know three most common choices of of the activation function that are used in practice. So this is pretty much how we construct um, a neural network of this kind of an architecture. So this kind of an architecture is also called a fully connected network. The reason why it's called fully connected is because in each layer to the next layer, we have a full bipartite connection. Every node in one layer is connected to every other node in the next layer or in the previous layer. Right? And, and, and that's the reason these, this kind of a network architecture is called a fully connected ne neural network. And the number of layers you want to have and the number of neurons in each layer that you want to have, they're all configuration choices. And they're also called hyperparameters. Yes, question. Yeah, so the uh, question is, um, I guess, you know, um, um, do the number of layers do the, uh, and the number of neurons that we have, you know, does that relate to overfitting and underfitting, right? How will we choose this? Yeah, so uh, how will we choose the right number of layers and how do we choose the right number of neurons per layer or in general, how do we choose what activation function to choose, uh, what, what activation func to function to use? And the answer is almost always cross-validation. And uh, the answer will be cross-validation for a lot of future questions as well. And that's just the nature of machine learning, right? Um, you have a lot of freedom, lots of degrees of freedom to tune a lot of different hyperparameters. And the right answer of what a hyperparameter uh, value needs to be is generally not obvious. Uh, by you know just uh, reading the problem description or just by looking at the data. If it were obvious, there would be a lot of theory, and there isn't a lot of theory for um, deciding what is the right number of layers by just looking at the data, or the, you know, what's the right uh, activation to use looking at the data. You can use some intuitions which you might you know develop over practice for a long time, but more often than not, even like the world's best experts they just generally tune it through cross-validation. Have a holdout cross-validation set and fit your network on your training data and see how well it performs on you know, a validation data. So what do you mean by alpha? Uh, so like learning rate. Oh, the learning rate, yeah. Yeah, uh, and in fact, you, you still need to choose alpha as well. You know, like the choice of alpha hasn't gone away. So we need to choose alpha, we need to choose the number of layers, we need to choose the number of neurons per layer, we need to choose what activation functions to use, right? There are lots of hyperparameters that you need to tune in a neural network, right? And uh, there are many strategies for doing cross-validation. For example, if it was just learning rate, then you can you could have done some kind of a, a binary search, you know, sweep some region and and find a good uh, 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 learning rate. But here, um, you basically have this hypercube of different hyperparameters, right? And each each point in this hypercube represents some kind of a configuration. And the way you go about searching it is um, people sometimes do something uh, that's called uh, a random search. We, 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 are, we are actually going to cover uh, strategies for tuning your hyperparameters uh, later this week. But in general, um, the answer of how you, how, how you choose these values is through cross-validation. Right? You know, try some, you know, uh, uh, come up with some uh, possible configurations, see how well it works. Uh, try some other configurations, see how well it works. And you know, keep trying that until you feel satisfied, you know, which is, not a very satisfactory answer, but that's exactly how it's done in practice.
Yes, question. Oh, we're going to come why we need a learning rate. We, we still haven't uh, seen how we, you know, optimize this yet. We are still talking about the network architecture. Uh, yeah, one more question. Uh, I think you already asked, but uh, in, in general, like, uh, given our problem, if we just go on increasing the, uh, let's say, the number of neurons in a hair or... The width. Yeah, in general, if if the width of the network becomes extremely wide, or if the depth of the network becomes extremely deep, you're you're absolutely you know it's absolutely possible that you you may overfit your network, uh, overfit on your data, and um, and uh, which is why you need to do cross validation, where you know you see, you measure the performance on a validation set and see that your training performance is very good, test perf uh, validation set is not so good, so you overfit. Yes, question. So, yeah. So the question is: Is the depth and the width uh, something that the model learns on its own? Uh, the answer is no, uh, which is why it's called a hyperparameter, right? So the parameters, in terms of terminology, parameters are those variables which the model learns on its own using gradient descent or whatever. Hyperparameters are the ones, uh, are the variables that you, as a, as as you know, a human being who's building the model, will choose. Yeah, so you know, the number of layers uh, is is something you decide before you start running your gradient descent, and that's called a hyperparameter. Uh, so for cross validation, you just try different configurations. It's not similar. Exactly. For cross validation, you you try different hyperparameters and see how well each configuration of hyperparameter works on the validation set. Yes, question. Can you not do something like metaprogramming where you make hyperparameters as the parameter of some other model? I'm not going to go into that. Uh, meta. <laughs> Uh, so there, there is a lot of research where uh, research of on on how to um, um, most efficiently or even learn what the right hyperparameters are going to be, and that's way beyond our scope right now. Uh, but yes, there is there is active research going on um, to to you know automatically learn the hyperparameters. Yes, this question. Yeah, so the question is, should the activation functions be bounded? Because uh, tan H and sigmoid are bounded, but ReLU is not. Um, there, are, there are good reasons to keep it uh, bounded, and there are good reasons to not keep it bounded as well. Um, maybe we'll cover it later, later today, or if not, uh, in the future. The, the, um, the problem with, right, so, so maybe we are, we are kind of um, uh, skipping ahead, but in general, um, the the problem with a sigmoid network, uh, a sigmoid function like this is, as you as you kind of uh, reach, uh, as as your z value goes farther and farther away from zero, the the gradient of the sigmoid is pretty much zero, right? So which means. Um, which means, if, if um, as we will see uh, uh, later today, if your gradient becomes zero, then your learning effectively stops because you know when you when you do a gradient update, if your gradient is zero, your learning effectively stops. Right? Yeah. So uh, I I am going to postpone that for you know another twenty minutes or so, and when we talk back propagation, probably that's going to be a, a better time to discuss that. So um, moving on. So this is how we we uh, construct a fully connected network, and now uh, once we have constructed it, um, we're going to see how we're going to train this network. Okay, and that brings us to back propagation. Yes. 
So recall um, A naught is x, right, and Z one is W one times A naught plus B one. A one is G of Z one and Z two is W two of A one plus B two and A two equals G of Z two and we see this pattern of alternating between Z and A, Z and A all the way until let us call it A of say capital L, where L is the number of layers in your network is equal to G of Z of L okay. and then Y hat is equal to AL. Right. And then our loss, I'm going to use script L of Y, Y hat is equal to, for now we are going to assume we are doing um, a classification problem rather than regression. If it is regression, you are going to have, you are going to see the squared error here, Y minus Y hat square. For regression, this is going to be y log y hat plus 1 minus y log 1 minus y hat. Next question. Uh, what should be L minus 1? So, uh, if there are L layers, should this be L minus 1? And we do not count that, we do not count the input layer. Yeah. Right. So, this is our loss and the, in order to, to, to uh, train our network, the Our goal is to do something like this. For L in 1, 2, and capital L, WL equals L equals WL. So, um, because we are treating this as a loss, this should be the negative of the likelihood, of the log likelihood because we are thinking of this as a loss and because it is a loss, we are doing gradient descent minus alpha times partial derivative of L. And similarly, B of L times alpha times partial So, very similar to, to gradient ascent that we saw for logistic regression. In logistic regression, we had just one set of theta vectors and we would perform gradient ascent on that theta vector. Here we have a collection of W and B uh, matrices and vectors and we have L number of these matrices and vectors. And what we want to do is for each weight matrix and, and vec, uh, bias vector, take the gradient of the final loss, right, final loss all the way at the end with respect to the corresponding um, weight layer, uh, uh, weight matrix of that layer and perform a gradient update like this and similarly to the uh, uh, bias term as well. Okay. So this is our goal and the way we go about calculating 
these gradients is using an algorithm called back propagation. Right? So, back propagation helps us calculate these gradients, but once we calculate the gradients, we perform gradient descent on the loss function. Yes, question? So, uh, the question is, is this stochastic? In this case, it is stochastic because uh, uh, we are, we have considered just one example, right? So, yeah, good question. So, think of this as y i, so y hat i and y i. So this is just the ith example. Right? So for, for a given example, um, this would be like the stochastic gradient descent update rule. Right? Now the question is now how are we going to calculate these, um, these uh, derivatives of L with respect to W and L with respect to B. Right? And the short answer there is chain rule. Right? And if you are, if you are, ah, familiar with multivariable calculus, if you are already experts at taking, um, at, 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 at uh, applying the chain rule in a multivariate setting, the rest of the lecture is probably boring for you because all what we are going to do is apply chain rule of calculus, multivariable calculus to calculate these gradients, right? And that's pretty much all what back propagation is. So back propagation is a fancy name, but the reason um, um, it's called back propagation is mathematically it is just the chain rule, right? But the way we go about calculating the gradients is we start from the end and work our way backwards. So algorithmically, right, uh, we, we follow a particular sequence of steps, which makes it appear that the gradients are being calculated in a backward fashion, right? But mathematically, it is just the chain rule, right? There's, there's a difference between um, a mathematical answer and an algorithmic answer, right? For the same mathematical answer, there can be multiple algorithmic answers. We saw that with kernels as well, right? For the same, for the same inner product, we could either calculate the explicit feature representation and take the inner, the, the dot product between them, or we can directly calculate the kernel function, right? They're, they're mathematically equivalent, but algorithmically different. Similarly, the back propagation mathematically is just the chain rule, right? But algorithmically, we calculate it in a way such that it is memory efficient and we reuse a lot of the computation while, when, uh, uh, when, when uh, we, we reuse a lot of the intermediate computations when calculating it, right? So that's, that's back propagation. Uh, and let's, let's see how we go about doing it. Any questions so far? Before we, we go into back propagation, there was a, a question asked earlier, right? Why, why can we not, what would happen, um, or rather the question was, wouldn't all the neurons in say the first layer learn the same thing, right? Why, why uh, aren't we just learning multiple copies of the same logistic regression? And the answer there is, if we perform an initialization where the entire network is initialized to zeros, all the weights and biases are initialized to zeros, then that's exactly what will happen. We start with a zero initialization. What we will observe is all the neurons in every layer are learning the same thing. So we, we will just end up having multiple copies of the same neuron within a given layer. And in order to avoid that problem, we perform what is called as a random initialization which means we're going to initialize all the weights and, and biases in the network in a random way by, by uh, calling a random number generator and, and uh, initializing them. And this is a necessary step, which is um, also called symmetry breaking because the network is, is, is symmetric within a layer, right? And in order to break that symmetry, um, we initialize them at, at, different, rand at uh, different random initializations. And because of that random initialization, they will end up learning different functions. So each logistic regression will end up learning, uh, with, within a layer is gonna end up learning different um, weights and biases just because we have, start, we have started from a random initialization. In case of logistic regression, no matter where we initialize from, we always reach the same answer. But over here, 
Um, in, in logistic regression, we always use the same answer because the problem was convex. But once we are in a neural network setting, we lose convexity. This, this giant composition of functions in general will not be con convex, which means depending on the initialization, we are going to reach a different solution. Right? And which is why random initialization is, is, uh, is very necessary. And the way we go about initializing is, so um, WL, so in, 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 um, in logistic regression uh, or, or, or in general in our learning algorithms, the way we set about doing it is initialize W's and B's and then for, you know, call it I in one through some time or rather T in some time step, you know, theta equals theta minus alpha times something, right? In order to do the initialization step, which in logistic regression and linear models, we would just initialize them to zero. In that, in, in, in place of zero initialization, we will instead do an initialization like this. So W, uh, L, initialize it with a random number generator, a Gaussian random number generator of mean zero and square root of two over ML plus L minus one. Or this is one choice or we could also do W of L is uniform minus 0.1 to plus 0.1. There are many different initialization schemes. So this is just, you know, a random uniform initialization and, and um, this is commonly done. This has a particular name. It's called um, Javier initialization. This is another choice of initialization. And what you will observe is the choice of initialization is also a hyperparameter when you are learning to fit your model. Yes, question? So the superscript identifies what layer each thing belongs to. So the question is, you know, uh, uh, is this shared by every neuron in the layer? So the dimension of B1 is the number of neurons in that layer and each element of this vector corresponds to one neuron. Right, so, yes, question? Yeah, so uh, this over here is the number of neurons in the Lth layer and the number of neurons in the L minus 1th layer. Yeah, we can we can uh, discuss the uh, the uh, reason for that. Uh, probably, if you remind me again, we'll we'll, we'll uh, uh, we, we can discuss the reason for that. Yes, question. But won't you just get the same answer like multiple copies, irrespective of what you choose? Because uh, this like if you choose a second layer and the first layer, first layer you also need the inputs, and second layer are the uh, nodes in the upper left hand corner. So. So the, the, the question is, um, is, is won't all the nodes be the same? The, the, the answer is no because W is a matrix and each row of the W matrix is associated with each neuron, right? And if W is initialized randomly, then each row of W is going to be, you know, a different, different vector, right? So when... Yeah, so over here, you know, um, I, I should probably put this as W, I, J, 
right? So each element of your W matrix, initialize it by performing a random sample from this question. Um, so in the update room, we are updating the whole matrix of the... Yes, when we are updating, we need to update. So you, we can also see this as, you know, Wij of L layer equals Wij of L minus alpha times partial of the loss with respect to W I J and this and this are equivalent. Now this is just a, a, a vectorized rotation. All right. So the training algorithm, you know, first we initialize W and B with some kind of initialization and for each for each uh, uh, iteration, we have a nested loop for L in 1, 2, L, W, L equals alpha times partial of loss with respect to partial. So this is going to be our, our high level algorithm. First initialize all the Ws and B with some kind of a chosen random initialization, right? Initialize the full network. And then for each iteration, we're going to, per, we're going to take some examples, maybe one example or maybe uh, you know, a, a few examples. And we're going to calculate the gradient of the loss with respect to the weights and biases of each layer and perform a gradient update of each of the weights and bias uh, uh, parameter. Yes, question? So what do you mean by weight one and weight two? Do you mean the uh, weight, by weight one do you mean the first layer or the first iteration? So we'll see what the relation between the weights are now, uh, next. So now what I'm going to draw is you can call it a computation graph. This this will allow us to understand how all the different terms are dependent on the loss. Right? So first I'm going to have I'm going to call this a zero, right? And this is basically just x. And to this A0, we're going to use matrix W1 and a bias B1, right? And here, now we have some outcomes. Z1 and the computation that happens here. So basically each um, um, square or a rectangle is some vector, right? And the clouds are basically computation, right? So some, some, some operation happening here. And here the operation is Z, Z equals W A plus B, right? And now this goes into a cloud of operation and comes out as A1. And here the operation is A equals G of Z. Okay. And similarly, next we have W2. to some operation for which these go in as inputs and out comes Z2, Z2 and again 
the notes. This we'll call it um, A2, and again this is just G, right? And here it is V equals W A plus B. And let's just draw one more. Um, Over here, let's say we have W3, B3, again um, V equals W A plus B, and we get V3. G get. So, uh, for the sake of simplicity, we will assume that the final layer has just one row because we want a scalar. And B3 will also be just a scalar. And Z3 is also a scalar. And we get A3. Right? And A3 is also equal to y hat. Right? And I'm just going to continue it here. And we have y hat and y. So one arrow comes into this cloud. This y comes in here, and out comes our loss. Right? And the loss is also a scalar. Right? We start with the input vector. Right? This the dimension of this is the dimension of our data. Right? And the dimension of z was a hyperparameter that we chose. Right? Um, and and the, the dimension of z, the dimension of a, and the dimension of B is equal to the number of layers in the first first layer, the number of neurons in the first layer, right? And the way we can compute Z is W A plus B, where the Ws and Bs are coming here, um, and so on. We 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 nest this by you know we are adding depth, and finally we have a loss, right? And what we want to do is take the partial derivative or the gradient of L with respect to each w's and take the partial derivative of l with respect to each b's right and then perform gradient update this question Yeah, so so uh, the question is, what if y hat was a vector, right? Um, y hat would would uh, uh, in general, y hat could be anything as long as your loss is a scalar, right? Eventually, we want the loss to be a scalar. Yeah. So the question is, uh, could we not? Uh, append, uh, um, yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, you know, ha have another, have another uh, one, extend the a vector by one and extend another row for uh, w. Yeah, you could, you could do that. Um, in um, you, 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 you could do that. But um, in practice, w's and b's are kept uh, separate, and there's a good reason for that. Um, we saw the, the reason in SVMs, if you remember that we were only penalizing the norm of W and not penalizing B. And there's going to be a similar reason why where we, we are going to um, uh, perform something called regularization that, that's going to come in the future only on Ws and not on B. So it's, it's, for notation, it's, it's, in this case, it's good to keep the Bs and Ws separate. 
Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, if you, you, you could do that. Uh, I mean, there is mathematically they are the same, right? Uh, you, if, you, if you think of, uh, if you, at every layer, if you extend A, uh, if you extend A by adding a 1, then you can get rid of B. Sure, you can do that. Uh, but in practice, you know, uh, it's, it's exactly the same, but in practice, you know, nobody does that. Anyways, so now the question is, how are we going to compute each of these partial derivatives of the final loss, which is a scalar, right? This is a scalar with respect to this matrix, this bias, and, you know, and so on. And, and that's where chain rule comes to help, and that's what back propagation is all about. Okay? So I'm going to switch to that board. So first we're going to make a few observations. So for this uh, e example, we are assuming binary classification, that is y's are in zeros and ones, and so y's are zeros and ones. But in general, your y's could be anything and your loss function could be something. Here we're just assuming the logistic loss. Right? So first we'll, uh, we'll observe that, um, so we will work it out for w2. Um, and even in the notes, we have done it for w2, but the steps are exactly the same for w1, w3, and b1, b3. Right? Once, once you know how to do it for one, you can just apply the same recipe for all of them. So, Partial of loss with respect to partial W2 is equal to, if you remember from our matrix calculus review, it's going to be partial of L loss with respect to partial W211 partial. To in this case, uh, in, 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 in the nodes, we, uh, the second node has three, so W, so th this had three, but, but in general, you know, it's just, uh, depending on the dimensions of W, you know, you have, uh, 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 in this case, it's just one, three, and Right? So this is a matrix, and you take the partial of this loss with respect to every single element and arrange it as a matrix. So this is, it, you know, this, this is just the definition of uh, uh, a gradient of a scalar loss with respect to a matrix. Yes, question? Uh, w2, w so second layer. You. You could, uh, um, so first let's work out the math and then we look at the algorithm of how we go about doing it. So this is just math, you know, what's, what's the gradient of, of um, yeah, this is for the middle layer, this, this is the middle layer, right? And now, make a few more observations. Okay. So the partial of L with respect to Z3, so what is Z here? Z3 is so the partial of L with respect to Z3 is equal to partial of Z3 times minus Y log Y hat minus 1 minus Y 
log 1 minus y hat right and this works out to be so I'm going to few, skip a few steps here it's basically the same kind of calculation you did with logistic regression right? and here this is minus y log y hat is basically sigmoid of z3 minus 1 minus y log 1 minus sigmoid of z3 right and you can do the steps these this basically the same kind of steps we did for homework 1 question 1 part a when you're when you're showing um, um, the uh, uh, positive definiteness of the hessian of logistic regression you would have calculated you know basically the same steps and this simplifies to a3 minus y so the partial of l with respect to z3 is equal to a3 minus y right and now We are now going to calculate the partial of each of these. We are going to pick one ij element and see what it turns out to be. So, the partial of L with respect to partial of W i j j of the second layer is equal to partial of L with respect to partial of a3 times partial of A3 with respect to partial of W2 IJ. Right? This is a chain rule. Any questions with this? All good. And then this you're gonna further break it down. times partial of any question from here to here again just the chain rule and so on and now we observe that this mm, did I miss something z it, oh so um, okay so one more step so partial of l with respect to partial of a3 times partial of a3 respect to partial of z3 times Partial of A A three to Z three and Z three to A two partial of Z three respect to partial of A two. Times partial of So basically apply the same thing and we get this this long expression right and how did we reach this expression to reach this expression what we basically did is you know applying the chain rule right so 
d z so d a 2 by d z 2 is a Jacobian because it is a vector valued function by a vector valued function right. So, this is going to be so here we are going to get uh, let me use the red to denote the gradients. So, the partial of L with respect to y hat right over here. So, anywhere where there is a computation we get a gradient or a Jacobian. So, L with respect to y hat is going to be a scalar. So, I am just going to denote it by a dot. There is another computation here output to input and this is going to be a scalar because it is a scalar, it is a scalar, the, the uh, derivative is going to be a scalar. From scalar to vector, so the derivative of a scalar valued output times a vector valued input is going to be a, a gradient, a vector. So, I am going to write it as a vector right and the derivative of vector valued output by a vector valued input is going to be a, a Jacobian matrix. So, I am going to have a matrix here. Similarly, vector valued uh, output to vector valued input is going to be a Jacobian. Right? Now, the 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 uh, the way we go about doing this, uh, the the common pattern that you observe is that you if the deeper your network is, you're going to have this alternating sequence of z's and a's and z's and a's and z's and a's, right? And from every a to every z, and from every z to every a, you're going to have keep getting Jacobians, right? And whenever there's a g, the Jacobian. Uh, because this is element wise operation, the Jacobian is going to be a diagonal matrix, right? And over here also, uh, this is going to be a diagonal matrix whenever the nonlinearity comes into picture because it is an element wise operation. And whenever we, we um, from z to a, because z is w times a, you will observe that the Jacobian from z to a will always be z will always be just w yes question the weights are all independent of each other but uh, in order to calculate the chain rule what we do is we break them down into local derivatives Yeah, the, the uh, well, what do you mean by independent? So, you said that the will be a diagonal matrix, but can there be dependence where you have derivative of So, here the, it, is, it is diagonal only for the nonlinearity because that is just acting element wise. There is no interaction between um, you know the other terms. You are just performing an element wise um, uh, uh, operation. So, this is going to be uh, a diagonal matrix, right. And from z to a it is always going to be the corresponding weight matrix and from a to z it is always going to be a diagonal matrix, right. And no matter how deep you go, you are just going to keep getting this diagonal matrix, corresponding weight matrix, diagonal matrix, corresponding weight matrix and so on, right. And now when we want to calculate the gradient of and the gradients that we want to update are for values over here, right. These are the ones we want to these are the, the, the parameters that we want to update, right. So, we want to calculate the, the, the gradient of the final loss with respect to this blue dot, final loss with respect to this blue dot and so on and construct our update matrix, right. Because this matrix we saw is, you know, each of this corresponds to a blue dot. So, we want to calculate the gradient of the final loss with respect to each blue dot and construct the corresponding update matrix. And in order to calculate the final loss with respect to the blue dot, we just apply the chain rule. And the chain rule says, back to the chain rule, the chain rule says 
each of these are going to be this is going to be um, so z to a is always going to be the matrix w of 3 a to z is going to be a diagonal matrix of uh, g prime and this thing over here is what we calculated already that is a3 minus y right so we're going to get a3 minus y times w3 times diagonal of g prime of z2 times this one now how do we handle this so once we bootstrap this no matter how deep our network is we're just going to keep adding on you know the w matrix itself and the diagonal of g prime the next w matrix the next diagonal of g prime next w matrix next diagonal of g prime and that's going to be a recurring pattern and we just need to figure out the starting end which we which is common for all which is just you know the a3 minus y and all the way at the beginning and for all the way at the beginning we are trying to calculate the gradient of a vector times a scalar right so this is a vector and this is a scalar z z2 is a vector wij is a scalar right so in in our picture now we are trying to calculate um, the gradient of the z vector with respect to the scalar and this is again uh, pretty straightforward right and this turns out to be So if, if we are doing it for our wij, this will just be a matrix with zeros everywhere except a j of 1 in the ith position. Right? And the reason is again pretty, uh, pretty simple because z is just w uh, 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 w a plus b so the uh, uh, the derivative with respect to w so w i j can only influence the ith element of z w i j cannot so if, if w i j uh, is, is say from from the second row so all these parameters of w can only influence the second uh, uh, second element of z. So the derivative of this vector with respect to this is going to have zeros everywhere else and the influence of ijth element on the ith element is just aj. Okay. So this is going to be just aj in the ith position. Any questions on this? And, and, and so, if, if we uh, kind of do a dimensional ch check, this is 1 cross 1, W3 is, in this case, uh, um, in, in, in the, in the uh, example in the notes, it's 1 cross 2, and this diagonal is going to be 2 cross 2 with, with only diagonal entries, and this is going to be 2 cross 1. Uh, in that example, there's... Um, um, there's only that there's only two so the other one will be zero and aj will be um, um, entailment and now we can combine all of these into um, into a single entry so this is basically a3 minus y is a scalar times w3 and when you multiply a, a diagonal matrix with another matrix you get a matrix which is the same as performing element wise multiplication right when you multiply by a diagonal matrix uh, with a uh, uh, with a vector it's essentially uh, the same as performing element wise multiplication and this whole thing is now a 1 by 2 times 
8j which is 2 by 1. This is the ith position. And further, uh, th this can be further simplified as a 3 minus y times w3 element wise g prime of z3, right? And because it, this is zeros in everywhere except the ith position, this vector we only need the ith index times a j one okay. and this is for i j element. So, partial L with respect to w i j is the i th element of this vector times j th element of this vector which means partial L with respect to partial W, the full matrix is just the outer product between these two vectors. Okay. So that is A3 minus Y, W3, G prime Z3. So this is the vector from which we, we, we took the ith element. Instead, um, for the full matrix, it is going to be this vector outer product with a j of one transpose. This question? It is A j one because we are calculating with respect to W two and for W two sorry I should have kept the picture here. For W two A one is the thing it gets multiplied by. Okay. So what 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 you see here is there is um, a fair amount of notation, but the main idea to, to uh, take away from this is the loss is, the final loss is always a scalar and we want to take the derivatives with respect to elements of a given matrix, right? And for that, we use the chain rule to, to start taking the gradient all the way from the final loss to the layer below before to the layer before to the layer before to the layer before and each of those gives you a Jacobian and those Jacobians have a repetitive pattern. The very first time it is something different you know a 3 minus y and this comes from logistic regression and then onwards all the Jacobians you are going to have this daisy chain of Jacobians and they are very easy to compute. They are going to be the corresponding weight matrix or a diagonal of the derivative of the activation function, right? And you're going to have a daisy chain of this, of these Jacobians, depending on how deep your network is, right? And the dimensions are always going to be such that the um, output of this layer is going to be the input of this layer, and the output of this is going to be the input of this, and you know they, they will always match in dimensions. So we're going to start with a one by one, and going to end up with a one, and all the intermediate. Um, uh, intermediate dimensions where they, where, they, where they meet will always match and once you once you multiply this whole thing you are going to end up with a scalar a one by one um, one by one uh, uh, solution and that is going to be the value you are going to fill in here and then you repeat that when you repeat that you see that uh, that one by one entry was basically the product of the ith element of one vector times the jth element of another vector which means the full matrix is just the outer product between those two vectors. This question? In your final results, they will look to G prime J three. Yeah, this should be, you're right, so this should be two. Thank you. Yeah, it's a two, two over here. I uh, made it a three over there. Right, so that's basically that's basically the uh, applying the chain rule to get the the partial derivatives, and basically backprop is now. Now this what what we see, you know, this daisy chain structure. If we want to compute uh, the partial with respect to W one now, right? It's basically you're going to add two more links into this daisy chain. Right, into this daisy chain of Jacobians, you're going to have two more Jacobians, and the final. Um, uh, and, and, and this is going to be specific to the previous layer, right? 
and basically backprop tells you that if we start computing the, the derivatives with respect to matrix all the way from the end, then we can reuse the terms. We, we do not have to recompute the, 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 the product of this which is going to be a, a, a vector for the next, for the previous layer. We are just going to have another W matrix and a diagonal matrix and the, the corresponding uh, uh, A matrix, A, uh, A vector for the previous layer. So, we can reuse all this computation when we are calculating the derivatives for the previous layer and that is that's basically back propagation. It, it suggests you that you should start working backwards so that you can reuse computation. Right. Any question? Yes, question. Yeah, so, so here we are, you know, uh, in this daisy chain you observe that we are moving from vector to vector to vector, right? So, the local derivative will, will be a Jacobian. With, with, respect, with, respect, with respect to vector, exactly. All right, so then we will break.